Test? Everyone hear me all right? On behalf of the Iowa State Committee on Lectures, I want to welcome you here tonight. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Carolyn Gerster. Dr. Gerster has been active in the Respect Life movement since 1971. She was co-founder of the National Right to Life Committee, serving originally as the vice president, later as a, the chairman of the board, and is now currently the president of the National Right to Life Committee. She has spoken in 32 states, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, and has testified in numerous legislative hearings on respect life issues. She is a practicing physician in Scottsdale, Arizona. She is a Protestant and the mother of five. Dr. Gerster. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I apologize. I apologize for the delay. And uh, there's always a problem with the, with, the, uh, with the projection. I don't know uh, why you never suspect that we have a problem. When you bring slides, there is always a problem. I, I uh, was interested in the, in the introduction. Uh, and I know it's not too popular with ZPG to be the mother of five boys. And I'm reminded of, uh, of Dick Gregory, who spoke at the National Youth Pro-Life Coalition uh, three years ago in November. And uh, to prove that we come from a wide base, you see, we have uh, to, uh, to balance people like uh, Jesse Helms and uh, Ronald Reagan. We have the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Dick Gregory, Eldridge Cleaver, Johnny Cash. Anyway, uh, Dick Gregory was given the, uh, the speech there at the convention. And of course, before he became a social activist, he is above all a comedian. And they introduced uh, Dick Gregory as the father of 10. And he said he felt very embarrassed by the introduction, that he realized that that very day that the New York Times had asked every American family to limit their children to 2.11. And uh, he said that he understood that the United States government had made a similar request, and that he respected the New York Times and his wife respected the United States government, and they were trying their best. But he said it was that 11th hundredth of a baby that caused all the trouble. Every time they tried for 11th hundredth of a baby, a whole one kept slipping out. So <laughs> maybe that's the same. <laughs> anyway, that's about my only, this is not a very funny subject, but uh, that's about the only joke I know on the, on the, uh, the issue. I, I'm leaving, um, leaving here tonight and driving up to Omaha, going to, uh, because we can't get a flight out in order to time to testify tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, on euthanasia before the Oklahoma State Legislature. Uh, I drive to Omaha and catch a plane out uh, to Kansas City, switch planes and get there just 20 minutes before the hearing. Then go on to Washington, D.C. I say this because we're not limited to abortion. In fact, abortion is only the tip of the iceberg. We spend at least 50% of our time with euthanasia and human experimentation, non-therapeutic, done without informed consent. If I could uh, just give you a little bit of background about abortion legislation in the United States, since that's we're coming at at this university, I guess, tonight. I'm going to go to the slides because I think one picture is worth a thousand words. But to give you some idea of the background, prior well, for the 200 years uh, that we were a colony in America, and uh, during the early years of statehood, up until about the mid-19th century, America had the same law as England, that is, common law. And it was believed that the baby came alive at the time of quickening, that prior to this, the baby was in a vegetative state, as between the 18th and 20th week. So abortion was a misdemeanor prior to quickening and became a felony after quickening. Now, of course, in 17 and 1677, uh, as the aftermath of the discovery of the microscope, 
sperm was first seen. And by 1854, scientists had observed conception, fertilization under the microscope, the sperm penetrating the ovum. And they knew then that life began at conception. And medicine moved out of the dark ages into the dawn of enlightening. Now the AMA realized that the law was archaic. And I can't really believe that this was the AMA, but it was. They appointed a committee headed by Dr. Storer, who was both a, uh, from Boston, who was both a physician and an attorney. In 1857, Dr. Storer's committee, after study, came up with the following rec recommendation. Physicians have now arrived at the unanimous opinion that the fetus in utero is alive from the very moment of conception, that the willful killing of a human being at any stage of its existence is murder. Dr. Storer didn't fool around. Abortion is, in reality, a crime against the infant, its mother, the family circle, and society. The uh, AMA acted on the committee's recommendation, and by 1859, the following resolution was passed. We condemn the procuring of abortion at every period of gestation, except as necessary for preserving the life of either the mother or the child. Now, this recommendation was sent to all states and all state legislatures, and for the next 100 years, there was uniform protection of the unborn uh, in every state of the Union, with the exception to protect the life of the mother. Now, the thing that is interesting about this is that the very same state legislatures that ratified the 13th and 14th Amendment to the Constitution, conferring, conferring personhood, citizenship on the slave, were the same uh, was the same legislature that passed the anti-abortion law, overwhelmingly, by the way, Protestant. Now, somebody sent me a tape of Mr. Baird's speech in October, and I would only like to say one thing about it. I think, as a Protestant, it is very painful for me to hear somebody make a blatant appeal to religious bigotry. Life begins at conception, of course, is not a Catholic dogma. It's not a it's found on page 55 of Aries Developmental Anatomy. I just looked it up before I left home. That's the embryology text in use in every uh, medical school uh, on the West Coast. It's found in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's found uh, in Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. Life begins at conception, of course, as a biological fact. It's no more uh, repealable than the law of gravity. But this is not primarily a religious issue. As the, uh, the little poster said outside, my speech is supposed to be, who lives, who dies, and who decides. And friends, that's a civil rights issue. I think that an appeal to religious bigotry is no more to be condoned than an appeal to racial bigotry. The abolitionist movement that led to the finally overthrow of slavery came about almost entirely in the Methodist and the Quaker church. This did not make slavery a religious issue. Many people criticized Pope Pius XII and the Catholic Church, particularly in the Deputy, a play that was written in Germany, because the Catholic Church did not impose its morality on the Third Reich in the matter of the genocide of six million Jews. It's very curious to me that the same people blame the Catholic Church for imposing its morality in the, in the murder, the killing of unborn children, handicapped and, and retarded. The, the court decision actually is poorly understood by most Americans because it is so sweeping. With, uh, at approximately 1967, the first state, Colorado, passed the permissive abortion law. This was followed in about Six, by 16 states during the next uh, five years, uh, excuse me, next three years. Uh, these were so-called humane legislation passed uh, with the recommendation of the American Bar, not the American Bar Association, the American Law Institute. And the, uh, they prescribed uh, abortion not just for, for, the, uh, for the life of the mother, but for fetal abnormality for rape and incest. But 33 states of the Union 
kept the same law, including Arizona, uh, that, uh, that abortion was only to save the life of the mother. The last, the last legislative defeat that we ever had was in the Washington referendum in 1970. We lost by less than 2% of the electoral vote. You hear a lot about polls now. You hear about Gallup polls, Harris polls. Well, friends, as Dewey could tell you, the only valid, reliable poll is the ballot box. And from the time of the formation of the first, first pro-life organizations within the state in 1970, we never lost another legislative or referendum. We actually, uh, within 1970 to 1972, 30 state legislatures, 30, introduced abortion legislation, and it was defeated in 30 state legislatures without exception. The only two states to hold referendums were Michigan and North Dakota, both overwhelmingly Protestant. And abortion uh, legislation was defeated 63% in Michigan, 72% in North Dakota. Even more remarkable was the fact that the state of New York overturned their abortion statute of two years standing in both houses, only to have it vetoed by one man who died recently, Governor Nelson Rockefeller. We could have overturned, turned this thing around within 12 months. We never had that chance. We woke up one morning, January 22, 1973, and found out that seven men in long black robes had decided for actually 210 million Americans. And of course, the rest is history. We're, we're in the process of a, a constitutional amendment, which is a horrendous uh, undertaking, but we're making amazing strides as everybody here in Iowa that was here in November of 1978 realizes. The, the Supreme Court said in essence, and then we'll get onto the slides, the following. They divided pregnancy into three trimesters. They said in the first 12 weeks, the state may do nothing, may do nothing except state that a physician do the abortion. They may not prescribe where the physician does the abortion. It may be in his, uh, in his office in a freestanding clinic or as one enterprising young man in, uh, in the state of New York who advertises and has a portable suction machine. He's one of the few physicians that still makes house calls and he does them on the kitchen table. So the Supreme Court did not outlaw the backroom abortion. The Supreme Court simply moved the backroom abortion to the front room. And those that, uh, that had access to the Chicago Sun-Times uh, we'll recall the expose of abortion clinics that came out in the fall of this year. Now, the, the Sun-Times is certainly not a pro-life newspaper. The Sun-Times editorial policy has been consistently uh, anti-life. However, they felt that abortion was, a, uh, was an exploitation of women. A group of young uh, reporters from the paper uh, went to the leading abortion clinics along Michigan Avenue and found a number of surprising things. They found that you did not have to be, not only did not have to be uh, pregnant to get an abortion in those clinics, you didn't even have to be a woman. They submitted male urine. And in a significant number, they were scheduled for abortion. The, uh, they found that there were 12 deaths in Illinois, none of which were known, since 73, legal abortion deaths, none of which were known to the health department. At any rate, so much for the first 12 weeks. We know nothing about it. In July of 76, uh, the court did say that records, that is the number of abortions done, could be required. You may not inspect an abortion clinic. You may not require proof of pregnancy. You may not demand a path report or consultation. And in essence, uh, what we have done is, is move, as I said, the, the backroom abortion into the front room. With between 12 and 28 weeks, the court said the state may for the first time protect the health of the mother during the abortion, but could not protect the, the, uh, the baby's life. Now viability, when I went to medical school, and it surely couldn't have gotten worse, viability is 20 weeks. That's the age of the earliest survivor. Viability between 20 and 28 weeks, University of uh, Alabama Neonatal Center, is 21%. That was 1975. Of course, these statistics are about as uh, or about as sacred as the four-minute mile. As science uh, progresses, uh, viability is pushed back. But the court was, in 1973, already eight weeks into, uh, into viability. Now, abortion, by definition, is the premature expulsion of a fetus prior to viability. 
after 20 weeks, this is no longer abortion, it's infanticide, and it should be really uh, called by the correct term. Now, from 28 weeks to 40 weeks, the court said for the first time the state, if they choose, can require uh, or can uh, legislate to protect the life of the baby. And unless the mother's health is in jeopardy, and this certainly sounded reasonable until they went on to define health. And the court defined it in the sense of the World Health Organization, that is a complete, uh, a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. Well, according to that definition, I've not had a healthy day in my life, and I don't know how many people in the, in the, in the room have. Uh, they, they specified uh, reasons for which a woman could have an abortion up to 40 weeks, and these included age, too young or too old, uh, number of uh, children in the family, uh, poverty, unhappiness. And so what we have is de facto abortion demand through the 40 weeks of pregnancy. To my knowledge, this is the only country in the world where this is true. Now, in the case of Dr. Waddell in, in uh, California, the trial is now going into its uh, second trial, actually. It was a hung jury. Uh, that was a 32-week-old baby. Uh, the judge, when he instructed the jury, said, we are not here to judge the right or wrong of abortion. Dr. Waddell could have done the abortion later than 32 weeks. But did he, in fact, strangle the little girl uh, or allow her to, uh, to die of exposure after she was born alive? So we're, uh, we're far, uh, far afield, uh, far, far beyond viability. Could we just quickly go into the, into the uh, slides, and then I'll, I want to leave a lot of time. How much time do we have, all told? I want to leave a lot of time for questions. It's 8.25, right? And we have to get out of here at... Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Thanks. I apologize to those that have seen, the, uh, have seen the slides, but I think for those that have not, I don't think there's any substitute for them. Uh, when I uh, spoke at ASU, there was in a state university, uh, Paul Steiner, who's the head of Planned Parenthood, said don't, these were, it was a law, st uh, law school, and they were graduate students. He said, don't insult the intelligence of the graduate students. He said, they all know what dead human fetuses look like. And I said, I'm sure that everybody here knows what uh, dead oriental civilians look like, but did anyone here object to the, to the pictures of Milai? And I think without pictures, we don't really know what we're talking about, particularly in this subject. We're going to have a little trouble starting, and that's what I was afraid of. Let me, uh, let me go down, unless somebody's familiar with that carousel. The first slide is a difficult one. Okay, this is, this is actually a little pamphlet that uh, was put out by Seoul. There's a, there's a uh, chapter of Seoul in this university, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a high school, high school senior, actually, uh, drew this in Minnesota and uh, put it in a pamphlet form. I just copied it for the slides. And it's a people's story or how society protects almost each and every person. Of course, once upon a time, there were tribes that believed only members of their tribe were people. There's, there's nothing new about redefining personhood. And when they met a man from another tribe, they killed him. And there were once some greedy people who decided Indians of the New World had no souls and took away their lands. And once upon a time, some wise judges decided that black people were pieces of property and not persons. And not so long ago, a court decided a woman was not a person, was not allowed to join the Virginia Bar Association. When some German people decided the Jewish people were an inferior race, and for those that saw Holocaust, of course, he killed six million of them. Once upon a time, some lawyers changed their mind and decided the unborn baby is not a person. That time, of course, is now. And the moral is, if you're from another tribe or a woman or from the wrong country or a fetus or a deformed baby or have skin that isn't the right color at various times in our nation's history, you've had to be very, very careful. Now, here's a riddle. Under current U.S. law, which is not a person, a Supreme Court judge, a corporate president, or an unborn child? The hint, of course, is who can hire the fewest lawyers. <laughs> the court decision of 1973, uh, the court decision of 1973 uh, was for many historians a replay of history. This was not the first time the court had, uh, had uh, committed a boo-boo. In, uh, in 1857, with the Dred Scott decision, uh, the court 
had ruled that the slave was not a citizen, but then they went on in the decision, and I want to make this very clear, uh, and said for the purpose of this decision that the word citizen and the word person are used interchangeably. At the end of the decision, the court ruled that actually the slave was property, and the right to own property was protected under the Constitution. And uh, there is the 73 U.S. Supreme Court, <laughs> and there's how they voted. And lest anybody think this is a Catholic issue, I'm sorry, we've got a little off the screen. Can we move this forward or back or whichever way the, the uh, picture gets? Uh, you will notice that uh, the, only, uh, the only Catholic on the court is Mr. Uh, Justice Brennan there, and he voted with the majority. And uh, Rehnquist, a wider Protestant. Uh, Rehnquist, I'm proud to say, is from Arizona. Uh, there's a time in our history that we, uh, that we often would like to forget. And as the, the, uh, as the court decision of 1857 uh, was corrected with the 13th and 14th Amendment, the court decision of 73 is corrected by the Human Life Amendment. Uh, I think sometimes you can get amazing clarity on this from children. And my, uh, my nine-year-old son, Mark, two years ago, he's now 11, came home from Kiva School, and he had a, it dates you if you say history, what do you call it, social studies. Uh, he came home with a sign of social studies to, uh, to write a short report on the Dred Scott decision. And we looked it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Those of you that have a encyclopedia at home, go and look it up. Because in there, they have Chief Justice Taney's justification for the majority opinion. That was also a 72 decision, you know. And uh, Chief Justice Taney, if I could paraphrase it, said, uh, after all, we're not making slavery compulsory that every American citizen has the right to choose whether to own a slave. He was pro-choice also. However, the abolitionist should not impose his morality on the slave owner. So I said to my son, I said, Mark, that sounds reasonable to you, doesn't it? Uh, doesn't it? And he said, no. And I said, why not? And with that infinite wisdom that God gives to nine-year-old boys but denies to Supreme Court justices, he said, because the sl slave was a human being. Now, on that simple fact, the abolitionists based their whole argument. If the slave was not a human being, the abolitionists had absolutely no case. If the unborn child is not a human being, we have no case. This is the, <laughs> this is the moment it all happens. This is a uh, fertilization under electron microscope. Uh, this is actually a rabbit, uh, rabbit ovum and sperm. But the, uh, at that moment, with the human being, is decided all the limitations that you have. Decide if you're going to be a male or a female, or I should say a female or a male, I shouldn't. Uh, it's going to be decided whether you, what color hair you have, what color eyes, whether you have freckles, whether you're going to have asthma, how tall you are. Now, environment can modify, but the limitations are set at the moment of conception. Now, the one thing that the test tube baby, and actually we shouldn't say test tube baby, it really isn't a test tube baby, it's a Petri dish baby. The one thing the Petri dish baby did dispel I think forever, is that the baby is a part of the mother's body, you know, because this baby didn't become a part of the Petri dish for this, uh, for this brief time. Uh, the uh, people that breed cattle, uh, actually, when they do artificial insemination, in order to take the, the fertilized zygote back, they implant it in the uterus of a rabbit. Now, this cow does not become part of the rabbit's body in transit across the Atlantic Ocean. And th these things are, are ludicrous, but it's, it's good to point out because you hear this constantly, part of the woman's body. And this is actually a, uh, a, the prize photo, Minnesota, uh, from Minis well, it's actually the prize medical photograph for the year. It was taken by a Minnesota medical student. And uh, this is actually a five and a half week old uh, embryo, ruptured tubal pregnancy. But in a glossy print, you can see the demarcation of the digits, the hands, uh, really remarkable with the tiny size. And the, uh, is that focus for me? These are, these earlier uh, pictures are actually Nielsen's from, uh, that appeared first in Life magazine in 1965. And uh, they're taken for, for much of the, the photographs of the living, uh, the living embryo or fetus within the womb. This is a change from embryo to fetus, uh, which occurs at actually at eight weeks. This is the baby at six and a half weeks. Now, this doesn't look like a baby in a crib, does it? Of course it doesn't. My boys say this looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost. But in that, uh, in that little, uh, little head, which is disproportionately large for the body, you can see the three segments of brain. And already you can record a human EEG, electroencephalogram, by putting small instruments on that head. Now, why is this important? Because in order to transplant a man's organs, his heart, his kidneys, 
uh, by the Anatomical Gift Act, you have to have a flat EEG, a flat encephalogram for 24 hours before you say the man is dead and can use his organs. Now here's a little human being who you can, uh, you can kill at liberty in the United States and yet he has perfectly recordable uh, brain waves. The retina is developing, you can see the hand, the, the uh, digits, the fingers. Uh, quickening starts at six and a half weeks at first tentative movements, though the mother of course will not be able to feel the movement until approximately 18 to 20 weeks. The heart, by the way, starts, uh, starts beating at 18 to 21 days, circulating blood different than the mother's. If this is the only slide that keeps fading back and forth, <laughs> that's not a trick for the doctor there. The, uh, the, uh, if, we didn't, if the baby was truly a part of the mother's body, of course, we would not have an RH problem. And uh, the, the fact that the baby and the mother are able to live in parabiosis for the, to nine months is attributed to the placenta. The scientists are now trying to use the placenta for organ transplants because it subverts the, the uh, uh, immune process of the body. Now this is an eight week old, now officially a fetus. And uh, you, that's not a volleyball there, that is, that is a yolk sac which is about to disappear. It was feeding the baby up to now. You can see the, the uh, bone is now replacing cartilage. Baby has amazingly strong grip at eight weeks. If you put an instrument in the baby's hand, it will hold on and uh, with the strength that the baby lacks later on. Uh, the baby now is freely moving, uh, responds to light touch and pain. Uh, if, lest I forget myself, this is the last time you will hear me use the word embryo or fetus tonight. There is nothing wor wrong with the word embryo or fetus. Embryo is simply Greek for a little swelling. It denotes human development up to eight weeks. Fetus is Latin uh, for offspring or young one. There is nothing wrong with the word. It's used to denote a time of, uh, of human development, just like later we'll say newborn, then we'll say toddler, then we'll say preschooler, then we'll say teenager, then we'll say senior citizen. These are all links in a chain. But you see, uh, our opponents have taken the word fetus and used it to dehumanize the unborn child because that isn't a pleasant word. Say it to yourself, fetus. Sounds like fester, feces. It's, a, it's an ugly word. And it's not nice to kill human beings. Okay, if you're going to heal, kill a human being, you have got to give him or her a different name. People have known this in war, in civil strife, whether it's Japs or Gooks or Pigs. The cavalry officer that, uh, that swept down an Indian village, he wasn't killing human beings. He was killing savages. The, the Germans did not kill human beings during the genocide program. They killed Untermenschen, subhuman. You've always had to give a human being a different name if you're going to destroy that human being. But I like the... Anglo-Saxon four-letter word baby. We all know what we're talking about. Now this is what our, the opposition likes to call a blob of protoplasm and it does indeed look like a blob of protoplasm. That's the chorion. And however, if you peek in, guess what is there? You see there's, there's a six and a half uh, week old intrauterine baby. And these are the carefully uh, formed, formed uh, uh, beautifully formed feet rather of a 10 week old. Uh, living baby within the womb, the dark spots are where the bone is replacing cartilage. Now I have a page from a narrow, uh, a right to choose actually newsletter which cites a narrow uh, speakers bureau and says to the speakers to describe the way that a 10 week old, uh, I don't have it, I have it here under the podium, uh, conceptus I think is the word that's used, looks, no arms, no legs, no baby at all. Now, it's, it's pretty obvious, I think, anyone that has the, the, uh, the, the interest to look at an embryology text that these are the feet of a 10-week-old. And uh, this is a 12-week-old. Uh, uh, this is an abortion. This is under the Human Life Amendment that is sponsored by National Rights Life, the only justifiable abortion in the series. This is cancer of the uterus. You can see the white cancer invading the uterine wall. The cancer would have killed both the mother and the baby. Uh, this is Dr. Liley's hand from New Zealand. He's the father of fetology. We use it, however, to show the, the uh, perfection and yet the small size of a 12-week-old was still within the uh, amniotic sac. Now, every organ of the adult is present at six and a half weeks. Every organ of the adult is present and functioning by the 12th week. This is a watershed in human development. Beyond this, nothing else is added, only time uh, and nutrition. Uh, the baby actually is doing a number of remarkable things. We've now invaded the secret world of the womb and uh, with television cameras 
and uh, whatever, and we, uh, we know a lot more about life that goes on in there. But I think it's typical of man, whenever he enters a new environment, the first thing he does is to kill the inhabitant. And I'm afraid this is what's happened with the womb. This is a close-up of a living baby sucking his thumb. This baby's 14 weeks, and evidently here's a close-up of a 17-week-old. Uh, either you kick the habit in the womb or you were born a thumb sucker. And some babies are born with thickly callous thumbs. This, of course, is to develop the sucking reflex. You can see the eyes are sealed shut to allow the retina to develop. The eyes won't open again until 20, <coughs> approximately 26 to 28 weeks. Uh, the baby is also swallowing a tremendous amount of amniotic fluid. This we didn't know. When Dr. Liley was, uh, was actually doing the RH exchange transfusions, he became fascinated with this. And uh, he made the fluid sweet. And sure enough, the baby would, uh, would swallow more. He made it sour. The baby would stop swallowing. The baby had developed a sweet tooth or a sweet gum at this early age. However, uh, he wondered what would happen if he used saccharin. And uh, actually, 95% uh, of the babies thought it was sugar and kept on swallowing. But 5% stopped. He went back to these youngsters when they were four years old. And he found out that a certain segment of our population that saccharin does not taste sweet. It tastes bitter. And this is already evident. Uh, in the womb at this early age. The, uh, uh, the vocal cords are developed by the end of the 11th, beginning of the 12th week. And the baby is capable of crying. We cannot hear the crying because of the weakness of the vocal cords and the fact that there is only fluid conduction, not air conduction. Now, occasionally something happens to make this evident. There was a, I was stayed with the Lileys in New Zealand when I spoke there in 75. And uh, Margaret Liley told me of an Australian patient that in which air had been insufflated into the baby's uterus. In other words, they had put air in during the, uh, uh, they don't do this anymore. It's to see if the, if the placenta overlies the outlet of the womb to be sure the woman won't uh, bleed at time of delivery. Uh, they now can use uh, echo rather than air. But during the night, the baby had uh, got its face into a bubble of air that had been left there and kept his, pa his parents rather awake all night with his crying, which must have been an eerie experience. The point is, if you could hear this crying, we wouldn't be sitting here uh, in Ames, <coughs> Iowa, talking about the right or wrong of abortion. But the baby is a perfect victim. You see, the baby can't be, can't be seen or heard until birth. It can't be felt till 18 to 20 weeks. And during the war in Vietnam, we used to liken it to the bombardier that touches the lever and doesn't know or really care much what goes on underneath. And this is <coughs> the living 16-week-old uh, baby, uh, Nielsen photograph again. At this, uh, at this age, you see the faces of the baby is is distinct. In other words, this baby appears different than other, uh, other babies. Uh, you can't distinguish this earlier, but by face, your photograph of your baby is immediately recognized. The baby has a sleep-wake pattern. When I brought my, my boys home from the hospital at four to five days, I thought it was, a, it was a desire to annoy the parents that caused them to sleep. And I'm sure you've all had this experience. They slept all the way through the day, and they would awake at exactly five o'clock and scream from five to seven. It turns out that, uh, that this is really no intent of the baby to, to annoy you, that this is the time in the womb that is the noisiest time in our day. In our culture, 5 to 7 is the noisiest time of our day, statistically. So the baby is awake from 5 to 7. In other cultures, it's a different time. By the way, there's, uh, there's good indication that babies dream. Now, they, they're now working on uh, EEG. They, they're taking a simultaneous electroencephalogram. They're also placing a little electrode to the corner of the eyelid. And they're finding the twitching of the eyelid and the, uh, the brain waves that approximate those of an infant uh, or a young child during dream. Now, probably the baby only dreams about sucking his thumb or swimming around in warm amniotic fluid. But then the baby of the crib, you know, doesn't dream about a whole lot more than that. This is the famous cover of Life from 1965, Nielsen's picture. This is an 18-week-old boy. Now, I think we can sit here and I can, you know, throw embryology at you uh, all evening. But this is really a gut reaction, right? If this is not a human baby, why does he look so much like a human baby? I think we you finally get down to this point, you know. And here's some pictures I took from embryology text I thought were interesting. These are <coughs> intrauterine photographs of a living baby. Here's a baby gnawing on his cord, but fortunately, there's no teeth and can't do much damage. This baby is 21 weeks. Uh, here's a youngster, 24 weeks, holding tight onto his cord. Remarkable photographs, I think. And here's a baby of 24 weeks. Now, you see that, that uh, white Vaseline-like uh, uh, material? That, that is vernix that's used to, uh, to protect the, the skin and from the baby's fast-growing fingernails. Uh, this baby, 20, this is 24 weeks, too. This is the back of the head. Uh, this baby was the same age as the, the uh, baby that Dr. Edlin was accused of, uh, 
of having drowned following his live delivery. That baby was 24 weeks. Now, Dr. Evelyn was not, was not brought to trial because of doing the abortion at 24 weeks. He could have done the abortion, as we discussed, way into the 30 weeks. But the pathologist believed that he found some error in the baby's lungs. And you see, it's a, it's a strange type of a law that we have now. It is as though the soul or personhood or whatever you want to call it is just hovering between the woman's legs during delivery, waiting to be zapped in at the first breath of air. So we say, aha, you see, this is a human being if we have a little air bubble in the lungs. This is not a human being, or not a person, rather, if we do not find that air bubble. It's as though there is an elixir of life that's secreted by some unknown gland in the vagina that smears the baby as it comes on down. I think these are superstitious facts. If this is a human being, you know, uh, three minutes before delivery in the darkness of the womb, uh, this is a, uh, a living human being three minutes after delivery in the light of day. This is a close-up of the ear, 24 weeks. That's Lanuga hair. That will fall out uh, and come back in the same pattern, however. And here's a picture I took from embryology text. I think it's, it really shows what a difference a, excuse me, what a difference a day makes in the womb. That's the hand from 5, 6, 7, and 12 weeks. And here's a close-up of a 9-week-old baby's hand. Now, this is a hand that will never hold a bottle, but I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind in this room that this is a human hand. And the, uh, the court attempted to make the decision as far as personhood on dependency. They said if the baby was dependent, that the, the baby's life was, uh, was not meaningful in the full sense of the word. Well, none of us are really independent. But you become less independent if you go to the hospital, if you have an accident, if you have an operation, if you have a stroke. Very often you have to be fed by IV or tube. And uh, I have patients uh, that, that actually owe their life to a pacemaker. If the pacemaker dies, they die. I have patients with kidney failure that owe their life to a dialysis machine. This does not make them any less a person. Humanity is not dependent on dependency. I just got this from an ad in a medical journal, but I think it uh, points out the similarity. Here's exactly what we just got through saying. It's a summary. Now, these are premature babies. This is Kelly Thorman. She was born in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, she was born at 21 weeks. Her lowest uh, weight, I think, was one pound and three ounces. This is Kelly at three, uh, three weeks excuse me, after delivery. And that's the nurse's wedding ring on her arm for size. She is, of course, being tube fed. And uh, according to the Supreme Court, of course, had she, <coughs> had she not emerged from the uterus at this point, she would be a non-person. Of course, she'd have a hard time convincing her parents of this. This is Marcus Richardson. By his mother's menstrual history, he is one of the youngest babies born. Uh, by his mother's menstrual history, it's 19 weeks and six days. Uh, this is Marcus at 10 days. He was born in Cincinnati General Hospital. They don't have any birth pictures, but he has a well-recorded uh, birth weight. Here's Marcus at 10 months with his mother. Uh, actually, Marcus was brought to uh, very early in 1976 to try to get a pro-life platform and the Republican-Democrat platform. He didn't succeed, but it wasn't because he didn't try. This is Susan South. And Susan was born at 12, almost 22 weeks. If you ever have a chance, go to a newborn nursery in a large hospital uh, and look at the babies in the premature nurseries. These, it, it's really fantastic. They're, these little isolates really fighting for life. Uh, babies 10, 11, 12 inches long. They put them on water beds now because it increases survival, because it mimics the, the uh, amniotic fluid of the womb. And they now pipe the mother's, they record the mother's heart and play it to the baby because it increases survival. But you look at this poor little girl, you know, there are tubes running out everywhere, and you think, how is this little girl going to survive? And there's Susan at two years and two months. Now, all babies born prematurely are not this lucky. Statistically, babies born earlier than 32 weeks in a general hospital have a 10% chance of mental retardation or cerebral palsy. This has been cut down now to 3% in the, the better neonatal care centers. And you wonder, with all this proof, how the pro-abortionists could argue. And I think this, uh, this Schultz cartoon is really, really very uh, typical of the, uh, the anti-life mentality. You see, after, after Lucy has stomped on the beetle, and uh, Charlie has said, I thought your mother was live and let live, she looks down at the beetle and says he wasn't really living. So actually what has happened is, is they've redefined life. Now here's a, here's a very joyous occasion. This is a wanted baby at full term. And uh, the, the mother's happy, the father is happy, 
the doctor's happy, but the only real difference between this baby and this baby is that this baby is unwanted. This is an abortion. And being unwanted in America has become a crime punishable by death from which there's no reprieve. And the rest, of course, is, uh, is history. The current uh, body count is 1.3 million, which is actually probably a little under because a lot of the first trimester clinics don't report. But uh, actually, numbers like this don't really have much significance, do they? When you talk about a million, I think somebody once said that one death is a tragedy and a thousand deaths is only a statistic. But to bring this into some kind of context, you'll hear uh, the opposition say, ah, yes, but those are all early abortions, 88% early abortions. Well, I have no quarrel with that. That means 12% second and third trimester. Now, you take 12% of 1.3 million, and you come up with a number like 160,000. Now, at a time when we were all shocked with 912 bodies at Jonestown, these are big babies now. These are babies you could hold in your arms. You shut your eyes and imagine a mound of 160,000 bodies. Abortions are done in one of actually six ways. These are a little old-fashioned. We don't have the last two. Uh, but the, the, uh, sorry, the, the suction abortion is done, is done by dilating the cervix and uh, with sounds, then uh, actually inserting a, a very powerful suction, many more times powerful than a standard vacuum cleaner. And the, uh, the placenta, which is a spongy organ to the left of the slide, uh, and the, the very young, in most cases, uh, under 12, under 13 weeks, uh, unborn child is, is uh, torn into to pieces, but you can see the hands crossed over the, uh, over the chest. Now, this is actually a, a photograph from Winnipeg, Canada. It's taken down into a bucket. The reason for the coin is to show the size of the baby. Despite what Nero says, we do not distort size. We place an object or a meter in most every slide uh, of 10 to 12 weeks to give people an idea of the, of the size, which is the reason for the quarter. And surgical DNC, actually a similar, more old-fashioned procedure, uh, but still used. Uh, the head, uh, the torso, you can see the legs. The head is on the far right of the screen. Uh, the skull is avulsed. Uh, actually, the, uh, the reason that the head is not recognizable is this is a 12-week-old. And uh, the head is too large to be removed manually without crushing it with a ring of forceps, which is uh, the reason for the abolition of the skull. Now, at, uh, at eight or nine weeks, uh, the intrauterine baby responds to painful stimulus and can undoubtedly respond as a baby in a crib by 12 weeks. However, uh, this abortion doesn't take long. It takes about 10 minutes, unless the abortion is extremely clumsy. Uh, death doesn't take very long. But you can't say this for the late abortions. Now, saline is still the most common of late abortions. If a woman waits till, till uh, beyond 12, 13 weeks, then she enters a gray area regarding saline abortions, and it's safer for her to wait till 17 to 18 weeks till enough amniotic fluid has formed. They found out now that they can do DNC abortions later. They call these dilatation and evacuation, DNE. They can do them up to 16 to 17 weeks. Now, the skeleton is ossified by then, and it is. As Dr. Kate says, it puts the responsibility uh, back onto the professional rather than the patient because the body is dismembered and then has to be reassembled uh, like a giant jigsaw puzzle. The saline abortion, however, the, uh, about 200 cc's of, of uh, amniotic fluid is withdrawn, replaced with 200 cc's of 20% salt water. A number of solutions can be used. Salt water is most common in America. And uh, the baby who's, uh, who's larger, more mature baby, is swallowing, breathing the amniotic fluid in and out and actually dies the same kind of death as a sailor that is marooned and forced to drink seawater. Baby begins to convulse, convulses for about an hour and a half, grand mal seizures like an epileptic, and dies. The mother gives birth to usually a dead baby within 24 to 36 hours. Now, this is what our opponents like to call the products of conception. Now, this is a little 19-week-old girl, legal abortion in Los Angeles. Now, we used to refer to this during the Vietnam War. Uh, we used to, to refer to the, the similarity of the, the burn, which is almost identical to napalm because the outer two layers of the skin are burned off by the caustic uh, saline. Uh, we also refer to this as the intrauterine battered baby syndrome. You can see the contusion, the hemorrhage there. Uh, the, uh, the outer two layers of the skin coming off gives the baby this glistening red appearance. This is a 20-week-old legal abortion, also in Los Angeles. Uh, this is referred to in abortion circles very often as candy apple babies because of the glistening red appearance. 
Now, at a time when many of us are, are wondering, asking ourselves whether or not, and I agree that I am against capital punishment, we wonder whether capital punishment is not cruel and unusual even for a mass murder. You wonder what crime this baby had committed to deserve a death that took an hour and a half. Hysterotomy is another type of late abortion, and this is the same type of abortion that the uh, Edlin baby, after the baby had survived several attempts at saline. Uh, this is exactly the same I don't want to point a finger at England, because actually the same thing was being done as part of fetal experimentation in every major university medical school center in the United States, at Stanford, John Hopkins, uh, to name two that uh, we refer to in, uh, in our literature. You see, when the court said these were non-persons, it didn't take scientists too long to ask themselves, if these are not persons, then why cannot they be experimental animals? And for a while, it looked like the, uh, uh, the premature baby born by surviving abortion would replace the rhesus monkey. And a number of very macabre experiments came out at that time, the worst of which that I recall was picking up Medical World News in June of 1973, six months after the court decision and reading with absolute astonishment that uh, report by Dr. Peter Adams of Case Western Reserve, in which Dr. Adams, in conjunction with a group of scientists from Helsinki, Finland, had decapitated, cut the heads off 12 babies born alive by hysterotomy abortion. And immediately after uh, cutting the heads off, they cannulated the internal carotid artery. That is, they paced a large tube up to the main artery feeding the brain. They then kept these 12 little heads alive and uh, much the way that the Russians kept the dog's head alive in the 50s to study carbohydrate metabolism. Now, I know these are not pleasant things to hear. They're not pleasant things to talk about. But we're not talking about, you know, a late show, horror show on your TV set. We're not talking about the rise and fall of the Third Reich. We're talking about an experiment that was financed by NIH, National Institute of Health. Those are your tax dollars at work. The taxpayer paid for that experiment. Now, there has been a protection of human subjects. Uh, actually a uh, committee report that has come been published in June of 78. It is very good to protect prisoners, and we're very involved in human experimentation without consent, non-therapeutic human. We believe, as a matter of doctrine, that prisoners should never be used for non-therapeutic experiments because they're not free agents. And it does furnish some protection for the prisoner, but for the child for the, uh, and for the uh, premature baby that survives abortion, it is full of holes. You see, when I think the most dangerous word in the court decision was the word meaningful, as I said earlier. Meaningful is a value judgment. Some lives are more meaningful than others. And I was very proud to become a member of the American College of Physicians, which is an honorary society of internal medicine. But one year, they gave their award for scientific research to Dr. Stanley Plotkin. I'm mean, sorry, Dr. Stanley Krugman. Uh, so my my uh, voice is really getting <laughs> Dr. Saul Krugman. Dr. Saul Krugman. Uh, actually injected 25 retarded children from Willowbrook Home for Retarded with living hepatitis uh, virus in order to test a vaccine. Now, the, the people defending that experiment said nobody died. That's true, but of course the kids got hepatitis. The other defense of the experiment was that conditions were so bad at Willowbrook that the children probably would have gotten hepatitis anyway. Now, I think this is typical of the anti-life mentality. The obvious solution to the problem was to improve the conditions at Willowbrook, right? That would have been the solution to the problem. That is a positive solution to a human problem, not to test a vaccine by injecting a hepatitis virus into, into retarded children. Now, I waited, I waited for, for a flood of letters condemning that experiment, and I waited in vain. And I think the worst thing was reading the letters that defended it. There was one that appeared in New England Journal of Medicine <coughs> by, by Dr. Stanley Plotkin. It was the, the, uh, the name that I'd, I'd slurred there earlier. Dr. Plotkin said in his letter in the second paragraph, he said that if we're to study diseases in children, there is no substitute for experimentation on children. The only question is that for the earlier experiments, whether we're to use children that are, that have potential, or children that are human in form only. Now, that is rhetoric, I think, that echoes from the 1930s and from the doctor's trials of 1946. Sorry, I didn't mean to spend this long on the thing, but it got off. Now, the <coughs> we uh, used to hear in debates early, they said, please, whatever you do, do not mix euthanasia and abortion. 
that euthanasia will never follow abortion. Well, my friends, if you are willing to give a woman the unrestricted right to kill her unborn daughter, you had better be prepared to give that daughter the unrestricted right to kill her aged mother, and euthanasia has followed abortion as night follows the day. I'm leaving here tomorrow to testify at euthanasia uh, hearing. They're now called the Natural Death Act. This will be the, if this passes in Oklahoma, this will be the ninth state. Now, don't be <clears throat> misled by that innocent title. There is nothing natural about the Natural Death Act in its intent. The euthanasia movement moved very rapidly at first, and they scared people to death. This is an example of, of one of the bills that did not pass in Wisconsin. But it was not introduced by an eccentric. It was introduced by Representative Barbie of the state of Wisconsin, who is the author of the abortion bill. Not surprising. Uh, I hasten to mention, unless everyone's afraid to go to Wisconsin, this bill did not pass. I repeat, did not pass. It was introduced over two years running. It stated, actually, that anyone of seven years of age or older could request death for any reason, and death could be administered by anyone 14 years of age uh, or older, and the request for death could either, be, could either be verbal or written form. Now, this is not as macabre as it sounds. This has the same relation to the Natural Death Act as the abortion, the Supreme Court decision had to the 1967 Colorado law. What this is in Wisconsin is abortion and is euthanasia on demand. Now, the Montana law, which did also did not pass the same year, uh, had an interesting twist. It said that any individual 18 years of age or older could request death for any reason. If they changed their mind, they could rescind once, but they could not rescind a second time. That's to cut down on paperwork, I guess. And of course, <clears throat> here is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the arguments, I think, that, that uh, caused a great many people, especially interested in ecology and concerned about overpopulation, uh, to accept uh, the abortion philosophy. And of course, the, the, as far as, uh, as I see it, the answer, of course, to, op to overpopulation is contraception, is family planning. I wish to make it very, very clear. National right to life does not oppose contraception. Contraception is just that. It prevents conception. Nobody dies. The decision for that is arrived at by a man and a woman based on their own choice and by their religious beliefs. This is a matter for personal morality. Now, with every successful abortion, a human being dies. That's why abortion is a matter of public morality, and the two should never be confused. There's a world of difference between family planning and baby riddance. This was child, <coughs> child abuse was one of the compelling arguments. This was the only thing I was ever involved in before the Right to Life movement. I had to get out of it because I became too, too emotionally involved <coughs> as far as breaking down, crying, and, and, uh, and spending a lot of sleepless nights. The, I, I can understand well-meaning people that, <coughs> that listen to the uh, pro-abortion arguments that actually child abuse would be a thing of the past when every child was a wanted child. Well, what are the facts? What has happened since 1973? Uh, you should really call your child abuse center here in your state to get the local picture. In the city of New York, child abuse cases went from 5,723 to over 15,000 in the first three years of abortion on demand, the steepest rise. There was no difference, and I repeat, no change in the law, no change in the percent reporting from hospitals or a physician, which is abysmally low. I'm extremely ashamed of my own profession. Most child abuse cases are reported by relatives, <coughs> the police, uh, the, excuse me, neighbors, not by the hospital or by physicians. In my own state of Arizona, I called uh, again last month, it has doubled in the state of Arizona. There is absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind this is a real rise. This is an epidemic. There are 2,000 deaths recorded probably many times that, those that pass as accidents. Uh, child abuse is probably the commonest cause of death for children under two. But friends, you cannot nurture concern and love for the newborn child by legislating the indiscriminate killing of the unborn child. And you see, abortion is not a solution to a problem. Abortion is the refusal of society to look for a solution. Women's rights. I don't think that there is any young person in the room that can be as appreciative of the necessity for women's rights as I did. I'm a woman in a profession that's still dominated by males. But at the time when I went to medical school, the, uh, the admission committee, University of Oregon Medical School, was very candid. 
They told me that they accepted 2% blacks, 2% orientals, and 2% women. And I asked, uh, Dr. West was his name, I said, if I were both orientals, say, and a woman, would that increase my chances to 4% or drop them to 1%? And nobody laughed. Admission committees have no sense of humor. But the point is that at the time when I went to school, there was bias that you cannot, <clears throat> that you can't appreciate, I think, nowadays, thank God. I consider myself a feminist <clears throat> in the best sense of the word. But the sad thing is that, that abortion rode the crest of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the women's rights movement. And you cannot enhance a woman's right by denying the most basic right of all to her unborn child, to her unborn daughter. The right to choose to kill makes a mockery of the words free choice. These are <clears throat> the individuals that, that uh, would have had a, this is Helen Keller, of course, would have had a difficult time with the present pending euthanasia legislation. This is Dr. Sackett's bill in Florida. Uh, Dr. Sackett was defeated at the polls uh, two years, three years ago, two and a half years. But his bill is uh, still being introduced. Dr. Sackett is very candid about his bill. He states that under its provisions that penicillin could be uh, withheld from mongoloid children. Mongoloid children are very susceptible to pneumonia. And that this would, uh, would take care of the problem, would probably save the, the state of Florida uh, $5 billion in the next 50 years. He believes also that some 90% of individuals residing in, in um, custodial units in Florida could be allowed to die under the bill. Uh, this is a young man with Down syndrome. I'd like to say one, just one word about the word meaningful. Uh, we're no longer talking, as, as we've mentioned before, about the unborn. And this was never brought home to me as acutely as it was uh, two months ago when I found that there was a, a young man, Philip Becker, not as old as this boy. Philip Becker is 11 at the time that the court proceeding started. He's 12 now. He's, uh, he's a mongoloid, Down syndrome. He's exceptionally bright for a mongoloid. This should make no difference, but I mentioned this in passing. His high IQ is extremely high for a mongoloid child. He is a Boy Scout. There is no doubt in anyone's mind he will not require any custodial care. However, his, his real parents have refused to sign adoption papers. Yeah, there's three sets of parents currently that want to adopt Philip. Philip also has a ventricular septal defect. In other words, he has a hole between the two chambers of his heart. It's a very large septal defect. Cardiologists have testified that the longest he can expect to live is age 30, but that he could probably die by age 18 or maybe next year. He's already going into congestive heart failure. Because of the septal defect, his body is not nourished as it should, and he's probably the, about the size of an average eight or nine-year-old. He's missing a lot of school. His potential is probably not realized because of the days he misses out of school. It is not pleasant to die of congestive heart failure. You feel like you're drowning in your own fluid. Now the the <coughs> welfare <coughs> uh, department and the foster parents uh, went to court and asked that Philip be made a ward of the court for the period which his septal defect is repaired. This case is going on right now. This is reality. This is now. The court, uh, the judge ruled against uh, uh, the foster parents, the welfare department, and supported the natural parents who see Philip twice a year. They have not told him that they are his parents. They see him on his birthday on one other occasion. Because they, the judge said, if Philip were a normal child and were not retarded, there would be no question. But he said, we have to regard Philip's quality of life. And I'm not, I'm not inserting those words. Those are the words used in the decision, quality of life. Is Philip's life meaningful? The testimony of a pediatrician, which was hired by the parents to testify, uh, stated that, after all, Philip would not have to be institutionalized, but he was still retarded when he got out of the protective environment of the home. People would take advantage of him, and he would be rejected. And evidently, it's better to be dead than rejected. Now, 72 people in Santa Clara County have formed a committee called the Friends of Philip Becker. And they've got an attorney, bless him, that's, uh, that's taking this case with no charge at all. has been working for several months. They're appealing to a higher court. I hope Philip lives until it's appealed to the Supreme Court. But this is what that word meaningful has meant in the way of, of uh, if court cases since the decision. This is a boy who's... <coughs> From time to time, maybe not wanted. This is a little boy with muscular dystrophy, boy with cerebral palsy. And there have been, of course, races, ethnic groups during our culture that from time to time have been unwanted. There are some unwanted ages, and they all aren't young. The word abortion is not mentioned in the Human Life Amendment. 
and we do not limit to abortion. In fact, the, the amendment right, reads uh, that, that the word person is used in the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment to refer to all human beings regardless of their age, health, function, uh, or dependency, including their unborn, unborn offspring at every stage of their biological development. Section 2 reads that nothing will, uh, will actually prevent a state from, uh, from passing uh, those laws necessary for, for such medical treatment to prevent the death of the mother. But the law was very carefully worded to include the elderly. Now, people over 65 comprise about 11 percent of our population. This is rapidly rising, fantastically rising. The reason is, along with the death rate, which has stayed stable and then started to drop slightly, is the fact that you cannot lop off 1.3 million lives a year off one end of the spectrum without upsetting a very delicate balance of nature. This is something ecologists would have been able to tell us uh, many years ago. And soon, it is not impossible that people over 65 will comprise 25 percent of the population. Now, this is the next to the last slide, and we'll open it up to, <clears throat> to questions. This, to me, is still one of the most moving slides, <clears throat> even though it's black and white. This is a slide submitted by a pathologist in uh, Winnipeg Hospital. Uh, in Canada, this province of Canada, they do not or did not at that time use saline abortion. They thought it was not safe for the mother. They do all their late abortions by hysterotomy, and uh, now by prostaglandin. The, uh, these babies are all between the ages of, of uh, 16 to 24 weeks. You see their eyes sealed shut there. And this is a garbage can. Uh, the babies were born uh, alive by hysterotomy uh, abortion. The pathologist checked the body weight, measured the baby, checked the placenta. Now, this pathologist had been with this hospital for six months at the time he took the picture. He did, uh, he did not have very strong feelings about abortion one way or the other when he went to work there. But after six months of this, of course, all the abortions, by the way, are done on Saturday morning from 6 to 12 uh, because the operating room is, is free. In uh, California, in some hospitals, they're done on Sunday for the same reason, which I think is a macabre uh, touch. But uh, these individuals are awaiting incineration after having su uh, succumbed to exposure. Now, there are times, I have five boys, I used to have a, a practice, and I'm traveling now about, uh, about three days out of every seven. From Oklahoma City, I go into Washington, D.C. for two days, and it's averaging about three out of every seven. I'm sure that, that there are people out there in the pro-life movement in Iowa that are going through uh, the same thing on a local level, and you, you, we all wake up and wonder what on earth we're doing in the movement. Well, we all have our reasons for personal commitment. My particular reason is, that my husband <coughs> was born and raised in, in Germany. Uh, he's a little older than I am, but uh, he was a boy during the Third Reich. He was in Hitler's, uh, he was actually in, um, in uh, the Hitler Youth rather than the Boy Scouts. He went into Rommel's Africa Corps at 17. He was captured at 19, and he was a prisoner of war in Nebraska. In fact, when I spoke a year ago, Nebraska was very near his old prisoner of war site, which is now a chicken farm. And I was a child during World War II, but I thought, I'm sure, like many that saw Holocaust, that there had to be something wrong with the German people. And this is a very comforting thing, because you think that it can never happen again in history. You see, this was a result of a madman and, and leading a whole bunch of conscienceless uh, people, and it could never happen again in history. Well, I lived over there. I went to the Army in 58, and I uh, lived a year in Paris, then a year in Germany. And I was astounded to find the Germans no better nor worse than Americans. Then I really had a, a problem. And after I met my husband, and I became insatiably curious about the euthanasia program. I did a lot of reading on it. I must have driven him crazy during the first few years we were married, asking him what happened to the German people, what happened to the German medical community to condone and then tolerate the euthanasia program that took the lives of some 300,000. Uh, some five years ago, he told me that what was happening to American medicine was a replay of history regarding disrespect for life through euthanasia. Well, coming from somebody that has, <coughs> that has been through this once, this has a very chilling effect. Now, these individuals are naked, they're unwanted, they're piled up, and they're awaiting incineration. And most people are not old enough to remember the, the first except through Holocaust, but this is a photograph taken by a young American lieutenant in Belsen concentration camp. Now these people are also unwanted, they're also naked, and they're also awaiting incineration. Now the only real difference between this picture and the former picture is the age of the victim. And it is our contention that a society that can become accustomed to the first
can very easily become accustomed to the second. Thank you. Could we have the lights, please? embarrassing me. Thank you so much. Uh, there'll be some time for a few questions.